Hello, my name is Laurie and I'll be leading our time together today. Later in the service, Chris Powell will be bringing his message and we look forward to that. Today's Bible reading includes the Gospel of John chapter 20 and verse 19. In that verse, we read that in the evening of the first day of the week, the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. The last few days had been a tumultuous time for the followers of Jesus. From the heights of the triumphal entry to the lows of betrayal, arrest, denial, kangaroo court trials, flogging, torture and crucifixion. There had been stories from some of the disciples of miraculous happenings, but the majority had no first-hand experience. So, on the evening of this first day of the week, the disciples were huddled together. They were rightly fearful of the ongoing wrath of the Jewish leaders. I've been trying to imagine how fearful the disciples must have been. And I was reminded about an incident that happened during the period of the Cold War. You may remember that the Cold War extended from the end of the Second World War in 1945 to the early 1990s. Now, this incident occurred in the USSR, that collection of 15 countries that formed the United Soviet Socialist Republics. That was under the complete domination of Russia. The Eastern Bloc countries of East Germany and Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria and Albania had puppet governments installed and they always did the bidding of their Soviet masters. Throughout this time and before, millions of people who may have been disgruntled with the Soviet government suddenly disappeared from their homes in the dead of night. Some people were simply shot. Others went through the process of mock trials and then were sentenced to five years or 10 years or even 25 years of hard labor in the Gulag prison camps of Siberia. This was the time of the Hungarian uprising in 1956 that was brutally put down. This was the time of the Prague Spring in Czechoslovakia in 1968 under Alexander Dubček. It lasted seven months until an invasion by the USSR and most of the uh, Eastern Bloc countries squashed the attempted reforms. This was the time when many churches were forced to close and many believers were arrested and imprisoned. This was the time of a Dutchman called Brother Andrew. He earned the title of God's smuggler because of all the Bibles he took into the communist countries in his little Volkswagen Beetle car. The books were simply concealed by a blanket thrown over them and the reliance on God to blind the eyes of the border guards. This was the time of Richard Wormbrand, a Romanian priest who attempted to smuggle, smuggle Bibles into a communist country on an industrial scale inside a tourist coach. Unfortunately, the Bibles were discovered and confiscated and Wormbrand was jailed for 14 years before being released after a ransom was paid. During this time, I remember reading a story of a small church in the USSR. The number of active members in the church had already been dramatically reduced as a result of persecution by the communist regime. One Sunday morning, the remaining believers had unobtrusively slipped into the church to join in a short and quiet period of worship. 
midway through the, the, the worship, the church doors were suddenly flung open and a wild-eyed soldier armed with a submachine gun burst inside. <coughs> Walking into the centre of the small group of worshippers and with his finger on the trigger of the machine gun, he slowly looked around at each person staring directly into their eyes. The armed soldier then snarled, if you are not prepared to die for your faith today, you have 30 seconds to get out of this building and save your life. After the soldier issued this ultimatum, there was a scuffle of feet and a number of the parishioners exited the building. <coughs> When those who were leaving had departed, the fierce-looking soldier tightened his finger on the trigger of his submachine gun and glared at the remaining people. I think that the fear that this small group of parishioners felt must have been something like the fear that the disciples felt as they met together on that first day of the week. How did the story end? I'll let you know that at the end of our service today. Let's continue our time together uh, this morning as we sing two songs, How Deep the Father's Love and Blessed Assurance. i 
Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song. And I'd just like to invite Chris to come up and we'll just have a short interview together. Hello. Hi. <laughs> we colour coordinated, by the way. <laughs> we good to go? It's so. We're good to go. Fantastic. So, Chris, for those who don't know you, what was in your involvement with this church in the past? Um, we were members here for pretty close to 18 years, I think. Um, and um, Rosie and I were both elders. And um, for about 10 years, I think I was the chairman of the congregation. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. And so then, Chris, so in what, where and in what way are you currently worshipping and serving God? Um, we are worshipping at Sea Change, which is a Churches of Christ church down in the Shire, which has just recently moved from Janali across into Miranda. Um, and uh, our daughter, Tommy, and who many of you would know, um, and her husband Josh and our grandson, they also worship there. And we're, we're trying to get Nat and his new wife Ash to come there and worship there as well. Excellent. We'll see how we go with that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so then, um, Chris, what has been the most significant aspect of your life with God up until this point? It's a really hard question, Laurie, because th there's just not one significant yep. aspect I think I suppose um, this last 12 months we've had quite a few I've had quite a few health challenges I think last year I had 
over 50 visits to the doctor and or clinics and or hospitals throughout the year and multiple operations and all sorts of things. Um, so many challenges and we're probably going through a couple more of those right now, aren't we, Hunt? Um, but yeah, um, throughout that, God's being present and evident and helping us through all of those challenges. Um, and we still feel his really strong guiding presence in that process. Often in our weakness, his uh, glory shines through. It does, it does. And, and the, no one's exempt from difficult times. Indeed. Right? We're, we all live a human existence. Um, we all have our issues, whether they be, you know, um, uh, mental issues, spiritual issues, health issues, whatever they are, um, we all go through those things. And I think that what's great is that we can put faith in God um, and just know that he's, he's got it, even though we don't. Excellent. Yep. So, where do you see God leading you in the future? Um, we're continuing to worship down at Sea Change. Um, Rosie and I, we, we, we joined a life group um, uh, a number of years ago that was sort of led by um, a guy called the Reverend Dr Andrew Ball who was the the... CEO of Churches of Christ in New South Wales, um, an amazing man, uh, and we did a whole lot of work about um, where where we've been, where we are now, and our directions into the future. And we've we've worked through about where we want as we go into a time of retirement, where we want to minister going forward, um, and uh, so we, we've got those sorts of goals. Um, I suppose the health issues of the last 12 months have been delaying that a bit. Um, but yeah, we're intent on doing those things. So yeah, and it's basically not, not necessarily in positions of leadership, but more in positions of learning to be more servant contributors to God's work. Yeah. yeah. I remember going to a conference one time and uh, introduced to a chap who was 80 who just started a new adventure with God. So you've, uh, that's great. Yeah. So uh, final question. Uh, apart from your message that you'll bring to us shortly, is there anything that you sense that God wants to say to this particular body of believers? Now, I thought about that and I think I already touched on it. And it's just to say that we all go through times of trial and difficulty and hardships and we all we all ultimately have to face our own frailties um, and I just encourage everybody that you're not different to anybody else and God's got all of that under his care so that would just be the message I've certainly experienced that in small ways um uh, like yesterday, I thought I'd get on the front, front foot and uh, advise some people that I work with that I won't be able to do a, um, a job uh, on the weekend of um, uh, the Anzac Long Weekend. And then I realised today, that's not the, that's not the weekend. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I had to send another email this day saying, oops, I made a mistake. Yeah. So we look forward to hearing from you, from you shortly. Thank you Thanks. very much. Church, uh, do a uh, Bible uh, 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 reading. So this morning, uh, verse of John chapter 20, I uh, read from verse 19 to uh, verse 31. Jesus appears to his disciples. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed, and they saw the Lord. 
Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. And if you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus said, told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 to 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, when we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. This is the word of God. Let us come before God with our prayers for others and of thanksgiving to him. Dear Jesus, how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure. Please reveal yourself to each one of us today. As we think of the world, we see so much need. We ask that your love, peace, joy, 
hope, comfort and grace will be revealed. May hard hearts, blind eyes and deaf ears be open to the spirit of the living God at work in the world. Jesus, we give thanks for your provision of work, food, shelter and clothing for our families. Show us ways to help support and provide for the many who don't have these things that we take for granted. Open our eyes, Lord. Jesus, forgive us for the many times we take your blessings for granted. It is so easy to be thankful for the big things but also help us to recognise and give thanks for those everyday small blessings that we so often take for granted. Jesus, please forgive us for our sins, the things that we say and do that cause pain and sadness to you and to others. Help us to forgive those that have hurt us and to forgive ourselves so that we can move on in our lives. Keep us safe, dear Jesus. Bless our families with their many and varied needs. Bless all who rule over us. Give them your grace and wisdom to be honest and fair, having integrity in all they do. Jesus, bless this church as it seeks to be a witness to the community and to all who use our facilities or otherwise come in contact with us. Help us to recognise your Holy Spirit leading and guiding us in your ways. May we each build our lives on your firm foundation that withstands the storms and troubles that living in this world brings. Jesus, we ask that your Holy Spirit watch over and protect us and those we love and care for. We especially pray for Reverend Ilong and Simote while they are overseas. We pray for those who are lonely, sick or who have recently lost loved ones, for the homeless and for those who need a special touch from you, Lord Jesus. Yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. I'll just ask uh, Chris to come and bring us the message today. Thanks, Laurie. Okay, well, today we're going to talk about when life shows up. And um, the thing that I want to talk about today is that um, we're, in, we're going to talk about the time that is the week after when the resurrection took place and what happened during that week. So from Sunday evening through to Sunday evening, what happened? Now... I'm showing you a slide here of um, uh, of the grotto on the island of Patmos where John wrote Revelation. Um, last year, Rosie and I had the great privilege of visiting Patmos and we saw where St John wrote the Revelation. It was in this cave. Patmos was used as a place of exile for convicts and that's... And John came to Patmos because he he had been um, convicted and sent to Patmos by the Roman Emperor Titus Flavius Domitianus in 95 AD. In Patmos, we saw a little chapel down by the waterside where, and that was the site where John converted the entire island of Patmos to Christianity. It's a tiny little chapel. Um, And this cave is where John wrote the Revelation. There is some scholastic debate as to whether it's the same John that wrote the Gospel of John as well as 
the Revelation. Many people believe it's the same John. Some disagree with that. Some scholars disagree with that. I'm not here to try and resolve that for you today. Um, but uh, the most amazing experience that Rosie and I had was that, was that we went to this grotto on a Sunday. And when we got there, the church service was underway. It, it was the most amazing experience. It was all sung. There was lots of smoke. There was a choir and there was the archbishop singing through the service and waving the censer around. And it, it was incredible. And the place was packed. I mean, you could not find a square foot that someone wasn't standing in. It was just packed. Um, and we had the time to participate in something which was deeply moving, deeply spiritual, and a, and a mystical experience, I thought. Um, there were people reaching up and touching parts of the cave because they believed that they could be healed by, by touching the cave where John um, had, had lived. Now, the monastery on Patmos, which sits up above the cave, um, that monastery also claims to hold the skull of St Thomas, the guy we're going to talk a bit, little bit about today. Um, so it was a really interesting place to go and we were just talking in the car coming up and I said, you know, we're going to talk about this today and Rosie said, oh, I'd really love to go back there. I'd really love to go back there. It was one of the things that we saw that we really wanted to, to see again. So, today we're going to talk about the resurrection and the events of the week following it, which are the climax of John's Gospel. It's all in chapter 20. So the first 18 verses are all about the resurrection, but while that is an incredible event, there's also some really important lessons to learn out of the last verses from 19 onwards because they too form part of the climax of all of John's gospel. Chapter 20 is the climax of the gospel and you need to look at it not just as the resurrection, but also what happened afterward to understand that full climax. This passage also, like our visit to the island of Patmos and to the grotto, is deeply spiritual and it's miraculous. Um, there are miracles sprinkled throughout this passage. Um, and yet it speaks to even deeper truths about the relationship between God's initial creation and also what happened with new life in this passage. So we're going to explore the relationship between Genesis and the second Sunday of Easter. And who knew? Who would know? But, but there is a deep binding relationship there. Um, we're going to talk about how God's revelation rarely conforms to our own expectations. It certainly didn't for Thomas. It was like, surprise! <laughs> Um, and how our expectations of what God does and how he does it can often mean disappointment to us because we place our limitations and our expectations upon him and we'll seek to understand how we need to expect less but hope for more. Um, and we'll also explore doubt and its impact on belief. So let's just go to the readings. Um, and in verses 19 and 20, let's just set the scene. Easter Sunday, Jesus has risen. But that very night, the, 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 the apostles are all, the disciples are all gathered in a room and they are in immense fear. They're in immense fear of the, the, the Jewish authorities. They have heard that Jesus has risen, but 
but they haven't experienced anything yet. It's been mainly Mary um, and Mary Magdala, and it's basically been, you know, fairly limited what that revelation's all about. It's now the evening of that Resurrection Sunday. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just losing my place a little bit here. Sometimes when you scroll, scroll through, it just scrolls through a little bit too quickly. Um, it's now the evening of that Resurrection Sunday. And they're locked away. They're worried that they may be next. There's immense turmoil going through their heads. They don't know what's going on. Jesus is dead, but his tomb's now empty. Some are saying he's risen from the dead. And they're locked away. But then life turns up. Jesus turns up. Doesn't say that the doors were unlocked and he, you know, he knocked and he walked in. It just says he appeared. Somehow Jesus gets into the room with them. And the first thing he does is he calms them. Now we all know about the peace of God. And we all know that it can surpass understanding. But when Jesus says to the disciples, peace be with you, this is a direct grant of peace from God himself. This is, this is, you know, in the modern vernacular, it would be calm the farm, right? It is just a command of peace. Be peaceful. Then he shows them his injuries. He shows them the marks in his hands, the, the hole in the side. He shows them all of these things and they have the opportunity to see these things and they believe. There is, at this point, no doubt about Jesus' identity. He's set it straight. Here it is. This is me. Look at this. They are absolutely sure. But poor old Thomas, let's let's. Oh, no, let's let's not go there yet. The repetition of the he also talks about peace be with you again, and it's a repetition. He's saying to you, be peaceful again, and he wants to get them to focus. Focus on what I'm about to tell you. And he breathes on them. And he says, here is the gift of the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. He wants them to understand what that means. Now, the words that are used here about breathing on them, when you go back to Genesis, the same words are used about breathing on Adam breathing life onto Adam. It's the same thing. So you have the original life that's breathed into mankind and now you have the new life that Jesus brings being breathed onto mankind. It is distinctly related. Mankind's first... <sighs> nuts. Mankind's first breath is the very breath of life which God breathed out. The first breath of the disciples is the same. He breathed, Jesus breathed new life into the disciples through the same life creating spirit that was present at the very first moments of creation. But poor old Tom, he's not there. He misses out. He doesn't get to see Jesus in his resurrected form. Forever after, we've known Thomas as Doubting Thomas. Okay, well, we'll cover that a little bit more in a minute or two. The story of Tom and his 
doubts and his leap to faith is included in this gospel by John to illuminate the main purpose of John's story. To lead people to faith and grant them new life through Jesus. We can be really critical of Thomas and often people are, you know, doubting Thomas. It's, put, it's a put down. But each of us faces similar doubts as we go on our spiritual journey and often just about every day. Surely Tom was just doing what we all do when something miraculous occurs, but we're not there to see it. We go, oh, oh, oh. Did that really happen? Tom did the same thing. He doesn't just state his uneasiness at not having been there to witness it. He states that he needs to see hard proof, the same hard proof that all the others got to see the previous week. So when this gathering occurs again, it's a week later and the doors are locked again, and Jesus appears again. So, the disciples are all locked together in a room when Jesus miraculously appears. And again, his first words are, Peace be with you. And then he challenges Tom absolutely personally without having heard his complaint physically being present when Tom's made that complaint Jesus turns around to him and says in Tom's own words he turns around and says put your finger here see my hands reach out your hand and put it in my side stop doubting and believe this must have had a huge impact on Thomas. Huge. God's revelation of the risen Jesus was complete, but it was an overwhelming surprise to Thomas. Overwhelming. And particularly when Jesus uses Thomas's very own words back at him to say, now, here you go. I'm going to prove this to you. While Jesus showed sympathy for Tom's doubts and not condemnation, he also does that with each of us when we have doubts. You know, he doesn't condemn us. He shows us sympathy. He shows us care. He shows us love and concern. And in the last part of this verse 27, we see Jesus giving Thomas a direct command very direct stop doubting and believe that's it you're commanded to stop doubting and believe I've done everything you need stop doubting and believe the interesting thing is that confronted by that overwhelming evidence Tom immediately recognises who Jesus is and this is the climax, I think the ultimate climax of John's gospel because it's that recognition of who Jesus is that is the climax. When Thomas says, my Lord and my God, that is the highest level of faith recorded anywhere to anyone in John's gospel. It is a straight statement that recognises that Jesus is not just man, but he's God. Thomas says, my Lord and my God. Yes, there's the resurrection. And it's incredible. But there's the recognition of who Jesus is as well. 
that John leads us on that journey right through his gospel to get to who is Jesus and what is Jesus. And it's that Jesus is Lord and God. Now I'm going to say to you, I think Thomas gets a little bit, you know, misclassified as well and put down. Thomas wasn't a doubter. He didn't doubt the resurrection of Jesus. He just completely rejected it. He had not seen the evidence. And he just said, no, nah, I'm not going to believe this until such time as I see the proof. But once he got that physical proof, once he saw that evidence, he made a total commitment. And he recognised who Jesus was. Now, there's a guy, I think he's the son of um, Josh McDowell, who many of you might remember. His name's Sean McDowell. And he's the Professor of Christian Apologetics at Biola University, Baptist University in the US. And he says that calling Thomas a doubter implies that doubt is opposed to faith. And he notes that many people believe despite having doubts, the disciples included. Right before Jesus gave the Great Commission and then ascended to the Father, Matthew reports that the 11 disciples worshipped Jesus, but some doubted. In Matthew 28, 17, it says, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And that's the day that Jesus is ascending into heaven. While they believed that Jesus had risen from the grave, they still harboured some doubts. If the apostles of Jesus had doubts, even though they saw Jesus in his resurrected state, then it seems natural that many of us will have doubts along our journey as well. The second thing that um, Sean McDowell says is, calling Thomas a doubter implies that certainty is required for belief. When people think belief requires certainty, doubts and questions can be paralysing, painful, and sometimes even they can lead to despair. The Bible doesn't teach that certainty is required for faith. Um, according to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, belief is when we take something to be the case or regard it as true. Understanding this way, belief does not require certainty. In fact, depending on the available evidence, we hold beliefs with varying degrees of confidence. I'll give you an example. I may believe that my wife loves me far more strongly than I believe interest rates will go down this year. But I can believe that both are true at the same time. Jude 22 says that, and have mercy on those who doubt. This implies that doubt is not the opposite of faith, and it also, which is the first point above, and also that certainty is not required for belief, which is the second point. It also shows the posture with which we ought to approach people with doubts. Rather than improperly labelling them, we ought to extend care and grace for people with questions. No doubt about that. jumping sorry and then we look at verse 30 where it says the purpose of john's gospel in verse 30 john makes it very clear that the purpose in writing his gospel that in doing that his record is selective he makes no apology for saying i've included these things but there are many other things that jesus did that i haven't included um he goes about building a gospel that's designed to, to build a specific type of faith. That by believing, we may have life in Jesus' name. That by believing, we can say, my Lord and my God. And we don't have the benefit of the physical evidence. And that's why earlier on we see 
how much greater it is for those who haven't seen, who believe. Now, I just wanted to quickly just talk about what happens when we place our limited expectations on God. Um, that can be expectations about what God's like and who he is and how he can act. And in expectations, there's always, when we put our expectations on God, there's always an element of control. It's our thinking that then controls what our expectations are of God. And there's also the limitations of past experience. Thomas used his stereotype of Jesus, his expectations of Jesus, um, and he put limitations on what that could be. And then when he saw the evidence, that whole expectation got blown apart. Jesus challenged him directly and blew apart his expectations. You know, the Bible doesn't use the word expect very often. Um, it's about 20 times and expectations about six times. Um, and it's often used negatively. Hope, on the other hand, is found 164 times. The Bible exhorts us to hope rather than expect. Hope rather than expect. Hope does not place limitations on God and what God can do or who God is. To illustrate, throughout the book of Job, we see Job stubbornly insist on his hope in God. Despite all the calamities occurring around him, whereas Job's friends are recorded in that book about, his, about their expectations. Job's friends had expectations of what God was like. But Job had hope. Hope comes from a place of God-focused faith, while expectations come from a place of self-focused entitlement. And hence the reading in Romans 5, 1 to 5, and I'll just read through from verse 2. Um, through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So, quickly today, what have we explored? What have we done? What have we covered? We explored the relationship between the events of Genesis and those leading up to the second Sunday of Easter and what they may mean, that may mean to us today. We looked at how God's revelation rarely conforms to our own expectations. It certainly didn't for Thomas. And how our own expectations and stereotypes of what God does and how he does it mean that we frequently can misread the signposts. And we gained understanding of how we need to expect, le expect less and hope more. And we explored doubt and its impact on belief. So I hope you've enjoyed this little insight into this revelation that Thomas got to. He had all the benefit of evidence. It's interesting, the disciples had the benefit of evidence on the day of the resurrection. A week later, and Thomas completely rejected that because he wasn't there, but a week later when they're gathered again and he is there. Jesus appears again and suddenly put your hand in my put your finger in my hands and your hand in my side and he blurts out my lord and my god. And it's 
that recognition of who Jesus is that is, I think, the ultimate climax that we need to see Jesus as our Lord and our God. That's the ultimate climax in John's Gospel. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. I've uh, personally really appreciated your talk to us today. We're going to sing our final song, um, By Faith. So let's uh, join together as we sing.
At the beginning of our time together today, I mentioned about a small church in the USSR where the parishioners were struggling to survive under communist domination. Many people, in fear for their lives, had abandoned their relationship with God. The fierce-looking soldier with the submachine gun had burst into the church, threatening death to all inside. Those who did not leave acknowledged that they were prepared to die rather than forsake their relationship with God. When the doors closed on those who left, the soldier actually threw down his submachine gun and declared that he too was a follower of Jesus. That small group of believers had a short time of genuine fellowship and worship before they and the soldier had to resume their designated activities. To me, the message of this story and also the story of that first Resurrection Sunday, Sunday night, is, is that whilst the dangers and difficulties in our lives might be real, God meets us at our point of need. When God calls, he equips and enables all people who seek him to be faithful to him. Have you been challenged by today's service? Are you at the point of making a deeper commitment to God? If so, don't ignore his promptings. After this service is finished and the chairs are being stacked away, I'm going to invite Chris to come down and sit at our front uh, row of seats here. And Chris and I will be available uh, at the front to, for anyone who's seeking prayer, if that's what you'd like. So, this is, this is the end of our time together this morning. More importantly, this is the beginning of the rest of our lives as followers of Jesus. May we meditate deeply upon God's word. May we use our God eyesight and see the confused and aimless people around about us. May our hearts break for their eternal welfare. With God's help, May we bring hope, forgiveness, compassion, truth and love into every situation we find ourselves in during this coming week. 
Amen and God bless. No worries, no worries.